Greetings, mother factors. My name is Sam, and today I'm going to be having a chat with you all about one of the best action movie franchises of recent years. He's weird, he's feared, he's got a patchy beard. It's John Wick. Yes, the action movie juggernaut has been making a stir in the world of cinematic murder and mayhem for quite a while now. So I think it's high time that the soft-spoken assassin gets the 101 facts treatment. But how does the John Wick we see in the films differ from the original character? How do the filmmakers create music out of gunshots? And what's the best way to get henchman brains off your fine Italian suit? Asking for a friend called John Wick. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so strap in, strap up, and strap, uh, something else, as we prepare to count through 101 facts about John Wick. Number one. John Wick is an American film franchise which consists of three action thriller movies created by screenwriter Derek Kolstad and directed by stuntman and director Chad Stahelski. The first film also included stuntman and filmmaker David Leitch as an uncredited co-director. It's an action movie made by stuntman, so as you can imagine, the series is an adrenaline fueled white knuckle cinematic hell ride. Just my two cents. Number two. The series began in 2014 with the release of the first film, entitled simply John Wick. The film stars Keanu Reeves as the eponymous lead character, a retired but deadly hitman seeking revenge after Russian gangsters steal his prized vintage Mustang and kill a beloved beagle puppy given to him by his terminally ill wife before she tragically passed away. Much sad. Very vengeance. Number three. The story is reminiscent of an incident that occurred in Texas involving former Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell, who wrote a book entitled Lone Survivor about his fire team's ordeal during Operation Red Wings in Afghanistan in 2005. In the early hours of the 1st of April 2009, a group of men shot and killed Luttrell's yellow Labrador puppy, whom he had named Daisy, after the members of his team who had been killed. Number 4. Upon finding the body of his murdered dog, Luttrell armed himself with two handguns and chased the perpetrators through four counties in his truck, until they were apprehended by the police and ultimately charged with animal cruelty. Number 5. The film was originally going to be titled Scorn, but this changed when Keanu Reeves kept telling people he was filming a movie called John Wick. <laughs> I guess they thought it was easier than arguing with him. I mean, that's generally how I deal with Keanu. He's such a ball buster. Heart of gold, though. Heart of gold. Number six. Stahelski and Leach were hired to work on the film because of Reeves, who worked with them on the near legendary 1999 sci-fi classic The Matrix. Stahelski in particular was Reeves' stunt double in the films. Reeves supported their appointment, backing the veteran stuntmen for their very first directing gig. Because Keanu is a good guy. Number seven. Kolstad was inspired by classic noir films, such as the 1949 British film noir classic The Third Man, as well as themes of revenge and redemption, and the typical character development found in the works of Alistair MacLean and Stephen King. It's all very well researched and above board, guys. Number 8. South Korean cinema also had a large influence on the film. Park Chan-wook's The Vengeance trilogy and Lee Jeong Byom's The Man From Nowhere inspired the film's signature minimalist composition and graphic nature. Number 9. Furthermore, the classic Clint Eastwood film, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, inspired the specific lack of backstory for Wick. The filmmakers decided to keep it simple, was Stahelski saying he wanted to leave Wick's history open to the audience's imagination. Number 10. Somewhat surprisingly, one of the film's producers was American actress and businesswoman Eva Longoria, known for her work as Gabrielle in the acclaimed comedy drama TV series Desperate Housewives. Though the filmmakers never actually met Longoria, she's credited as a producer owing to the money she invested into the film. Stahelski has said of Longoria, we thank her for writing the check. Classy. Number 11. The character of John Wick was named after Kolstad's grandfather, 88-year-old John Wick. Apparently, the real Wick was tickled by the idea of having a movie character named after him, adding that it was his 15 minutes of fame. He further stated that the fact that John Wick is a hitman was the frosting on the cake. Haha, <laughs> nice guy. Number 12. Incidentally, the surname Wick is similar to the surname that the character Steve Austin plays in the 2013 film The Package, which is Tommy Wick. Uh, both movies were written by Derek Kolstad. Number 13. Apparently, Derek Kolstad had no specific actor in mind for the lead role when the film was just a speculative script. Kolstad admitted that, kind of counterproductively really, he always writes with a deceased actor in mind for the role, as he grew up watching old black and white films starring actors who have long since passed away. As a result, the role of John Wick was originally written for the iconic actor Paul Newman, who sadly passed away in 2008. Number 14. In the original script, the character of John Wick was actually an older retired killer in his 60s or 70s. Thunder Road executive Basil Iwanek changed this, however, arguing that the character's age wasn't relevant and that a veteran actor in his 40s would be a better fit, especially considering the physicality of the role. Number 15. Wick's dying wife Helen was portrayed by Bridget Moynihan, who Leach described as the heart of the movie. 
As part of her performance as Helen, Moynihan refused to read the rest of the script following her character's death, as she wanted to fully commit to the role of a wife who only saw good in her criminal husband. Ah, oh, that's sweet I guess, but also, she really didn't read much of the script then, did she? Number 16. The role of Viggo Tarasov, the film's primary antagonist, was filled by Swedish actor Michael Nykvist. Viggo's personality was already a counterbalance to Wick's single-mindedness. His costume reflects this, smart and stylish, but with colours and jewellery that reflects Viggo's quirkiness in comparison to Wick's less creative wardrobe. Number 17. As the Hellskin Leech were concerned with how viewers would react to all the, you know, violent murders in the film, when casting the role of Viggo Tarasov's son, Ayasev Tarasov, they specifically cast someone who looked like a, and I'm quoting here, sorry Alfie Allen, great prick. Yikes, imagine having that on your resume. Number 18. Veteran actor Lance Reddick plays the polite, composed, but quietly intimidating Sharon, the concierge at the Continental Hotel, which caters exclusively to the criminal underworld. When asked about the role, Reddick stated that the Kenyan accent he adopted helped add the formality required for the character, whom he said was first and foremost elegant. However, he also made it clear that Sharon was a killer and a survivor, basically someone you just don't want to mess with. Number 19. Many characters in John Wick are named after figures from the Greco-Roman world of classical antiquity. As mentioned, Lance Reddick plays the hotel manager Sharon, which is a reference to Greek mythology in which Sharon is the ferryman of Hades whom you must pay for safe passage. This is why Sharon put the gold coin in his pocket at the hotel, as John was, in a sense, paying for safe passage. Yeah, see? Highbrow stuff here. Number 20. Incidentally, in 2013, the year before playing Sharon in John Wick, Reddick also appeared in American Horror Story as voodoo deity Papa Legba. Both Papa Legba and Sharon are considered psychopops, which are entities that govern the borders between the living and the dead, and guide the deceased to the afterlife. Not many people can say they played a psychopomp, let alone two of them. Number 21. The Greco-Roman theme continues with Willem Dafoe and John Leguizamo, who respectively play the characters of John Wick's mentor, Marcus, and the chop shop owner, Aurelio. Together, their names are a reference to Marcus Aurelius, a renowned Roman emperor. Number 22, uh, ooh, ooh. Incidentally, Willem Dafoe and John Leguizamo share the same birthday of the 22nd of July. Good for them. Hey, it's a fact, okay? Number 23. Some have even suggested that John Wick's late wife Helen could be a nod to Helen of Troy, the figure from Greek mythology fabled to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Nope. She's called Jennifer. So beautiful, in fact, it started a war. This is somewhat indirectly the case for John Wick, who only begins his violent escapades after the memory of his wife is insulted with the killing of his puppy, Daisy. Number 24. Daisy, the dog that John Wick owns in the movie, was faithfully portrayed by a beagle puppy named Andy, who prevailed over dozens of other beagles to nab himself the role. I've heard of child actors, but this is ridi- Okay, I'll see myself out. Number 25. Like her owner, Daisy was originally going to be much older in the film at around 18 years old roughly equivalent to a human being in their 80s or 90s. This also changed from the movie, showing Daisy's a sprightly young puppy, rather than a trembling old pooch banging on the doors to doggy heaven. Number 26. In order to get the shot in which Daisy jumps up onto the bed and licks Wick's face, the filmmakers had to rub bacon grease on Keanu Reeves' face and beard so that Andy would scamper over to the actor's pillow and give him a proper good lick. I kind of have the suspicion that Andy enjoyed filming that scene a little more than Reeves did. Number 27. In order to imbue the film with reminders of Wick's late wife, the filmmakers worked in an overarching Daisy motif into John Wick that constantly links back to Helen. There's a Daisy symbol in the hospital room, there's a Daisy symbol on the coffee mug in Wick's house, and when the card arrives from Helen, there's a Daisy symbol on it too. Number 28. Originally, the studio did not want Daisy to die, taking the position that while the deaths of literally dozens of people throughout the film was all in good fun, the killing of a dog was simply too violent. Leech and Stahelski refused to change the script, though, due to the fact that it's pretty integral to the film, given it's one of the main reasons Wick embarks on the angry little killing spree in the first place. Number 29. The studio also didn't want Reeves to have a beard in the film, which was another thing that the filmmakers had to fight for, maintaining that Wick's face fur contributed to the grittiness of the film. The studio didn't like it, though, because they disapproved of their lead star's face being partially covered, apparently unfamiliar with the concept of hair. Number 30. Reeves prepared for the demanding role of John Wick by training with Navy SEALs for eight hours a day for four whole months. This included weapons and martial arts training that focused on the sort of close combat gunfights John Wick faces in the film. Number 31. John Wick was shot entirely with Ari Alexa XT cameras in order to capture the high budget fight scenes and fast paced action. Cinematographer Jonathan Seller worked with Stahelski's idea that they wanted to create a visual contrast between John Wick's happy home life and the world he gets drawn into, using much darker lighting in the underworld scenes along with a constantly moving camera. Number 32. 
The filmmakers also used different lenses on the same camera when filming night and day scenes, giving the daylight a hazy look that they felt was more cinematic. Yeah, there you go, a fact about the actual filmmaking process. It's not all behind the scenes goofing around fact on 101. We're respectable. Number 33. Throughout the film, Wick is dressed in smart, stylish suits that allowed him to fit into any scenario without standing out. Reeves described it as funereal and priestly while maintaining a sleek look of a killer. Hot. Number 34. Originally meant to be dressed in combat gear, the henchmen in the film were eventually kept in suits because, as Leach said, John Wick is a film about men in suits. This is all part of the stylish yet gritty underworld that fits the noir genre. Man, I wish I were a sleek, stylish killer. Most of the time I just have to settle for a disembodied voice or fact boy. Number 35. Willem Dafoe's character is in his bathrobe making a health juice when Vigo comes knocking. This was an addition by Dafoe, who wanted to play his character as an old school assassin focused on staying on top of his game. Stahelski said that this is one of the benefits of working with an experienced cast, as they provide useful additions that inexperienced directors may not have identified. Number 36. The film was shot in a number of notable locations in New York City. For instance, the Red Circle Bar is actually the New York County Surrogate Court building. The Russian mob boss's house and pool scene was shot on top of the James Hotel, and the Continental Hotel is the Beaver Building, also known as Coco Exchange. Number 37. Incidentally, the Red Circle Bar is a clear reference to another of the film's main influences, The Circle Rouge, a 1970 Franco-Italian crime film set mostly in Paris. Paris. Number 38. In the film, Wick shows himself to be an expert at close combat fighting, and switches between judoka, Japanese jiu-jitsu, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, all of which are martial arts disciplines that specialize in throws and chokeholds. Leech and Stahelski said that this was done to make Wick stand out, as Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo fighting styles are much more believable to watch in comparison to other fighting styles like boxing or kickboxing, which require much more editing to hide punches and kicks which aren't actually landing. Number 39. John Wick also smoothly transitions between several shooting styles depending on the situation. During close quarters battles and while moving through tight hallways, he employs what's called the center axis relock stance, which was developed specifically for combat. When moving and shooting at longer ranges though, he changes into more traditional weaver and isosceles stances, which were created for competitive shooting competitions. Number 40. The tattoo on Wick's back is the Latin phrase fortis fortuna adiuvat, which literally translates to fortune favors the strong. Numerous military units throughout the world use this phrase as their motto, which could possibly be a reflection of Wick's military background. Number 41. Production on John Wick only had access to two Mustangs and weren't allowed to damage either of them. No cheeky multi-Mustang pileups, I'm afraid. The meaning of life. Paying homage to Keanu Reeves' long and illustrious history of saying, Whoa. in films, many of the film's characters say, oh, in a similar fashion whenever John Wick's name is mentioned. However, the filmmakers deliberately avoided having John Wick say it himself. Number 43. Keanu Reeves has stated that for John Wick, he performed 90% of his own stunts. He and I have that in common. We're basically indistinguishable. Number 44. If that wasn't badass enough, Keanu Reeves learned to memorize the nightclub fight sequence on the very day the scene was filmed. That takes dedication, determination, and a very, very large paycheck. In nation. That didn't work. Number 45. Not only that, when shooting the top-level nightclub fight sequence, one of the most intense moments in the film, Reeves actually had the flu and was running a fever of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. He did all of that and he had the man flu? Fair play to him. Number 46. During a fight scene that went wrong, Michael Nykvist cut his entire head open. Actually, not his entire head, surely. Which apparently left his ear resting on his right shoulder. Ugh. Nykvist's injury required 80 stitches, and some of the last scenes had to be reshot to hide his presumably enormous scar. Number 47. The security guard who waves Wick onto the airport runway can be seen reading the 1970s thriller Shibumi. Written by Rod Whittaker under the pen name Trevanian, Shibumi tells the story of a retired master assassin dragged back into the game. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Number 48. During the safe house scene, the character's username displayed in the top right is Neo. Now that right there is a tiny little reference to Reeves' iconic character in the Matrix trilogy. Number 49. According to the director's commentary, the first cut of the movie was 2 hours and 20 minutes long, meaning that roughly 40 minutes had to be cut from the movie. This includes much of the ending fight between John and Vigo, which was originally much longer before it was cut down after Legion Zahelski agreed that Vigo shouldn't really pose too much of a physical threat to Wick himself. Number 50. David Leach also revealed that a lot of footage cut from the film was simply shots of Wick walking, stating that there's a ton of great shots on the cutting room floor that's just Keanu Reeves walking in cool environments. I mean, yeah, fair enough. 
Number 51. Most sources state that John Wick's kill count in the movie is a staggering 84. That's what happens when you kill people's dogs, guys. Just avoid it if I were you. Number 52. The film's total body count, including the people who were killed by any of the characters, is an even more disturbing 119. That means that just over 70% of the deaths in the film were caused by Wick himself. Number 53. Made on a budget of up to $30 million, the first John Wick film grossed a tasty $88.8 .8 million worldwide and holds an 87% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, making the film both a critical and commercial success. Woohoo! Glad everything worked out. Number 54. Lionsgate collaborated with Overkill Software to include John Wick as a playable character in the 2013 heist video game Payday 2, a character that is capable of several special abilities unique to him. Wick was added to the game just two days before the movie's wide release. Number 55. In 2017, Leech and Stahelski mentioned in an interview with Screen Junkies that there was an alternate ending for the film in which John Wick simply shoots and kills Tarasov. However, the pair ultimately decided to have Wick and Tarasov have a good old-fashioned fist fight in the rain. <laughs> so romantic. Number 56. In the same interview, Leech and Stahelski also stated that the body count in the original script was much, much lower, and may have been as low as only six deaths. That's... that would have been rubbish. More murder, please. Number 57. Not only that, the Hellski also mentioned that John Wick didn't even have any dialogue for the first 25 pages of the original script. Eventually, it was decided, though, that Wick would actually need to talk in the movie. Number 58. In 2017, the second film in the John Wick series was released, imaginatively titled John Wick Chapter 2. Carrying on from the first film, John Wick finds himself at the mercy of Italian crime lord Santino D'Antonio, who tasks him with the assassination of his sister, which, as you can imagine, gets proper messy very quickly. Number 59. However, the film merely ended up being a story about Wick and some form of daughter figure or another romantic interest. Ooh, not the same time, I hope. It was rewritten, though, to make sure that the franchise continued to be fresh and original, rather than lowering itself to stale cliches in which an aging male badass must somehow protect a beautiful woman. Number 60. To prepare for his role in John Wick 2, Reeves built on his previous John Wick experience with a three-month training regimen consisting of judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, marksmanship, and driving. Reeves also trained with the famed Machado Brothers, who are known for choreographing numerous movie fight scenes. Number 61. The name of the film's main antagonist, Santino D'Antonio, is itself a sarcastic little joke of its own. The baddie's first name, Santino, literally translates into Little Saint, while D'Antonio himself is quite the opposite. Number 62. As already stated, the actor who plays Russian Mafia boss Viggo Tarasov was the Swedish actor Michael Nykvist. Incidentally, the actor who plays his brother, Abraham Tarasov, is Peter Stormare, who is also a talented Swede. Apparently, the Swedish are particularly good at playing Russian mobsters. Who knew? Number 63. Actress Ruby Rose plays the sinister and conspicuously mute bodyguard and hitwoman Ares, a character who originally had a few quippy, sassy lines before her demeanor was modified into a mute character who used sign language. Apparently, Rose was originally not best pleased to be made mute, but Stahelski praised her for trusting his judgment. What do you think, though? Would you prefer Ares to speak? Or do you think she was more intimidating as the strong and silent type? Let us know in our snastastic YouTube poll. Nintendo 64. While preparing for John Wick numero dos, Reeves went to visit Lawrence Fishburne, an old friend from the Matrix franchise. Apparently, Fishburne brought up how amazing the first John Wick was, which prompted Reeves to reach out to Sahelski, who jumped at the chance to recruit the one and only Morpheus. In fact, the role of the Bowery King was thought up specifically for Fishburne himself. Number 65. In addition to Charon, Marcus, Aurelio, and Helen, the Greco-Roman theme continues in Chapter 2, with several more characters getting appropriately classical names. The previously aforementioned Ares was the Greek god of war, Cassian is likely a reference to the Roman saint John Cassian, and Franco Nero's character Julius is, almost certainly a nod, to Julius Caesar. Number 66. Somewhat interestingly, the title of the movie doesn't appear on screen until 14 minutes into the film. Well, I thought that was interesting. Number 67. After the opening title sequence, John Wick's car can be seen to have an inspection sticker with an expiration date of October 2014. This is a nod to the release date of the original John Wick movie. Number 68. The DJ performing at the exclusive criminal party in Rome in John Wick Chapter 2 is La Castlevania, who incidentally wrote the theme tunes for the first two John Wick movies. Number 69. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. The fight in the museum. <laughs> Couldn't help myself, sorry. Is actually time with the music in the scene, which is Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Stahelski had the percussion removed and replaced by Wick's gunshots. 
This required a very tight edit that proved a challenge for the filmmakers. Stahelski took it in his stride, however, stating, we got nothing else to do, which I guess is true. Number 70. The rooftop garden scene in which John Wick confronts Winston, played by English actor Ian McShane, uses the same location to which Spider-Man takes Mary Jane after saving her from falling to her death, following the attacks by the Green Goblin in the original 2002 Spider-Man movie. Number 71. According to Zahelski, one of the first ideas he had for Chapter 2, even before the film had a story, was to recreate the mirror room fight between Lee and Mr. Han from the 1973 martial arts action classic Enter the Dragon. This idea was realised in the form of the highly impressive fight scene in the Museum Mirror Exhibition, which is full of spinning mirrors for Wick to vandalise with bullets. Number 72. As you can imagine, however, shooting a compelling action scene within a hall of moving mirrors wasn't the easiest of tasks. The scene took months to plan, with everyone telling the Hellskin stunt coordinator JJ Perry not to do it. But they went and did it anyway, presumably because they had nothing else to do. The scene took five whole days to film, which was 10% of the entire 50-day filming schedule. Number 73. When the sommelier, played by British actor and comedian Preacher Serafinowicz, mentions that Wick was familiar with the German varietals, he is making an offhand reference to Wick using a Heckler & Koch P30L handgun for most of the first John Wick and part of the second. Number 74. Interestingly, John Wick Chapter 2 was partially filmed in Montreal, the largest city in the Canadian province of Quebec. Various locations and landmarks from the city appear in the film. For instance, the scene in which John Wick is chased through the subway system was partially filmed in the Plaster Arts Metro. For obvious reasons, the location's French signs were replaced with the typical New York City subway signs in English. Number 75. In a scene in the locker room, the Bowery King stands in front of two open lockers, one with a red shampoo and the other with a blue shampoo bottle, which serves as a nice little ref to the famous pill scene in the first Matrix film, in which both Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne had starring roles. Coincidence? Uh, surely that can't be a coincidence. That's insane if that's a coincidence. Number 76. Soon after that scene, John Wick says to the Bowery King, So I guess you have a choice. This phrase, or variations of it, was a constant theme within the Matrix trilogy. Number 77. But wait, there's even more Matrix references in it. In the Bowery King's office, a pair of circular glasses can be spotted on the desk, which some have suggested are a reference to the black circular specks that Morpheus wears in the Matrix. Number 78. For John Wick, colon, chapter 2, Reeves decided to up the ante stump-wise, stating that he performed around 95% of the stump work for this movie, in comparison to the frankly pathetic 90% he did in the first film. Number 79. Indeed, there are only two stunts in which a dedicated professional was brought in. The first was the scene wherein Wick gets hit by a car. I mean, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Number 80. The second scene Reeves didn't shoot, though, was the scene in which he's thrown downstairs by Cassian, who is played by the actor and acclaimed rapper Common. Frankly, I'd be honoured to let Common throw me down a flight of stairs. We can make it happen, Common. Come on, Common. Number 81. The fight between Wick and Cassian in Rome contains a stairway which forms one of the iconic areas of the popular Italy map from the Counter-Strike game series. Yeah, I know, right? Highbrow. Number 82. In one of the final scenes of the movie, Wick meets Winston at the Bethesda Fountain in New York's Central Park, and asks him why he's not already dead. In response, Winston says, because I deemed it not to be, then signals to one of his subordinates, who directs everyone in the area to freeze and look at John. This scene is eerily similar to one from, yes, that's right again, The Matrix, in which Morpheus describes to Neo the nature of The Matrix before freezing their environment, immediately stopping everyone around them. Both scenes also take place next to a fountain. Number 83. In the subway, when the $7 million contract is being sent worldwide, you can see a poster bearing the image of Chains, a character from Payday 2. Overkill Software put John Wick in their game, I guess it's only fair that Stahelski put Payday 2 in their film. Number 84. Most sources put John Wick's kill count in Chapter 2 at 128, which is, as you may have already realised, significantly higher than the first film. He just loves killing that John Wick. Number 85. However, some have suggested that while Wick kills more people in Chapter 2, he's a touch less efficient in his murderous rampages compared to the first one. While our intrepid assassin hit his intended target 86% of the time in John Wick, that stat dropped down to only 80 for Chapter 2. Number 86. In order to avoid an 18 rating from the British BBFC, 23 seconds of the film involving Gianna D'Antonio had to be removed from the film's theatrical release in the UK. Apparently, we here in the UK are just far too sensitive to behold such horrors, and we must be protected by our almighty censors. All hail the BBFC, the knowers for what's best for us. Number 87. Upon release, John Wick Chapter 2 garnered almost universal praise, bagging itself a respectable 89% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Made on a budget of $40 million, the film ultimately grossed $171.2 million worldwide, making the sequel an even bigger critical and commercial success than the first. 
Number 88. For some strange reason, the Australian distributor of the film, Entertainment One or E1, originally planned on releasing the film directly to DVD. When news of this insult was made public, E1's Facebook, Twitter and website were flooded with emails and messages from angry fans who demanded that the film was given a fair dinkum shot at a theatrical release in Australia. Albeit late, Down Under eventually did decide to give the film theatrical release. Well deserved. Number 89. Of course the carnage will not end with John Wick Chapter 2, as the third movie is currently on its way, entitled John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum. The film follows Wick as he continues to run from the scores of assassins eager to bump him off, forcing him to fight his way out of New York with assistance from Sophia, one of the few assassins who still trusts him. Number 990. 990. Stahelski has stated that he got the film's subtitle, Parabellum, from the famous 4th century Roman military quote, Civis Passum Parabellum, which means, if you want peace, prepare for war. Got a bit emo. Number 91. Halle Berry wanted a role in the third installment of John Wick so badly, she asked to be in the film before it even had a story. Apparently, Berry visited Stahelski in New York and outright asked him to be in the film. And when the film was finalised five months later, Stahelski got back in contact with Berry to ask her to play Sophia, to which she agreed straight away. Number 92. Apparently, one of the largest fight scenes in the movie sees Keanu Reeves going toe to toe with one of the most interesting additions to the cast, in the form of Boban Majonovic. He, by the way, is a Serbian professional basketball player who currently plays for the Philadelphia 67s. No, 76ers. Wrong way round. Standing at an intimidating 7 foot 3, Majanovic will play an assassin. I mean, who could have guessed that? Who might have a little more trouble staying hidden than the others. Number 93. In addition to Halle Berry and the big basketball man, Parabellum also feature a number of other recognisable faces. This includes Asia Kate Dillon, who played a white supremacist on Lawrence of the New Black, Jason Manzoukas, who portrayed the comically tortured cop Adrian Pimento in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and veteran actress Angelica Houston, who is arguably most fondly remembered as Morticia in the Addams Family movies. My darling Jennifer Lawrence was probably too busy polishing her Oscar. Not a euphemism. Number 94. Apparently, Parabellum starts off just under an hour after the end of John Wick Chapter 2, and after the fact that Lovejoy set the bounty on John to be open in one hour. Number 95. While the first John Wick film had 84 deaths and the second 128, Stahelski has stated that the third is scheduled to be even deadlier than that. Get ready for a lot of moida, guys. It's gonna be a bloodbath. Number 96. Since Reeves, Fishburne and Stahelski all worked on The Matrix, it's no surprise that The Matrix Easter Egg Fest continues with Parabellum. About halfway through the trailer, Winston asks Wick what he needs, to which Wick responds, Guns. Lots of guns. Not only are both lines lifted word for word from the Matrix, they are even spoken at the exact same speed. Number 97. The trailer for Parabellum also contains several shots of fairly vicious looking attack dogs belonging to Sophia. These movie pooches are trained only to bite at green velcro placed strategically on an actor's body, which could then be digitally altered out in the post-production stage. As a result, there was a very important on-set rule during the filming of the scenes involving these dogs. Don't wear green. Number 98. In order to make Sophia's command of her attack dogs as believable as possible, the filmmakers decided to forego having an on-set trainer and instead had Barry spend months training the dogs herself. So when you see them follow one of Sophia's commands in the film, they really are following her commands. Number 99999999. On the 14th of August 2018, a photo appeared on the John Wick Twitter account which showed Ian McShane and Lawrence Fishburne standing together, accompanied by the caption, Old Friends, New Enemies. This could mean that Wick will have two very powerful friends in his corner, or alternatively, he might be facing the combined might of the Bowery King and Winston. Or, in my mind, Bill Foster and Lovejoy. Number 100. Da -na 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 -na. Keanu Reeves has stated in interviews that he does not want the John Wick franchise to be tarnished by endless sequels that steadily diminish in quality, and as such, the series will most likely conclude with the third film. Number 101. Uh. However, don't fret, my little John Wick fanatics. The continued success of the John Wick series has led to the development of a John Wick spin-off TV series called The Continental, also produced by Lionsgate. It's believed that this will cover Wick's past, as well as the wider criminal world, and though the show will very likely feature appearances for Keanu Reeves and perhaps even Ian McShane, the lead role will apparently be an entirely new character, called One Jick. Yeah. That was 101 Facts About John Wick. Who's your favourite assassin? Could you survive a night at the Continental? Am I wearing my trousers too tight? Let me know the answer to all those questions in the comments down below. Also remember to give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already, because it really does help us out. In the meantime though, my lordy lordy, look at these two videos that have been chosen for you specifically. Click on one and uh, I'll meet you over there, babe, yeah? <laughs> I should never have done that, I don't know why I did. Sorry, see you there, bye.